Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Minister of Economy and Planning for the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, His Excellency Dr. Muhammad Al Jasser. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيتها النفس المطمئنة ارجعي إلى ربك راضية مرضية فادخلي في عبادي وادخلي جنتي صدق الله العظيم بداية أود أن أرفع لمقام خادم الحرمين الشريفين الملك سلمان بن عبد العزيز والأسرة المالكة الكريمة والشعب السعودي أحر آيات التعازي لوفاة خادم الحرمين الشريفين الملك عبد الله بن عبد العزيز رحمه الله رحمة واسعة لقاء ما قدمه لمجتمعه ولأمته وأرجو من العلي القدير أن يوفق ملكنا الجديد وولي عهده وولي ولي عهده وأن يحفظهم ويكلأهم وأن يوفقهم لخدمة هذا الوطن الكريم <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen I would like to thank my friend His Excellency Mr. Abdul Latif Al Uthman for inviting me again I don't know why he invites me again but that's his problem to this August forum and for the success in again attracting an impressive group of panelists and speakers to this event. <clears throat> Let me begin with a few words on the events of the last couple of days in my beloved country. I have often been asked by people based outside the kingdom, particularly by credit rating agencies and analysts, about the issue of succession in Saudi Arabia. Such questions may stem from concerns over political stability or uncertainty over economic policies. My answer has always been that these concerns were misplaced. Our system is very clear. When a king passes away, the crown prince takes over. And this is what you saw a few days ago when King Abdullah blessed his soul passed away. King Salman took over and the whole Saudi people pledged allegiance to him and the transition was smooth, dispelling any speculation about the future of Saudi Arabia. The same thing happened when King Abdullah took over following the death of King Fahad in 2005. As for our economic policies, our kings and their economic advisors follow a deliberate process taking a long-term view which weighs all sides of a particular issue with the primary aim of ensuring long-term stability and prosperity to our citizens. So you just had a clear demonstration of how robust our political system is, and you can rest assured that the policies and reforms undertaken under the late King Abdullah will continue unabated under the leadership of King Salman. Let me now turn to our session today. The title of the session is Look South, South to Success. Allow me, Lord Mandelson, and my colleague panelists to be a bit provocative here and suggest that true success in increasing growth and competitiveness of developing countries will not, I say not, come from cooperation in any specific permutation between North and South, whether South and South, North, South, or North, North. It will come from a change in our development paradigm. Let me explain briefly with the limited time I am given for this address. Since the middle of the last century, our thinking as development economists has been dominated by the dualism 
of developing, of developing economies. That is, the existence of a backward sector, meaning agriculture, with surplus low productivity, low wage labor on the one hand, and on the other hand, a modern sector, manufacturing or raw material extraction, characterized by higher productivity, higher wage labor. Development then was seen as the process of moving the economy and the labor force from one dominated by the backward sector to one dominated by the more productive modern sector, which would result in higher value added and higher living standards. The more successful countries, that is those which were able to achieve higher growth, were those with with, were those which took better advantage of their low labor cost to develop their modern sector. This was basically the story of all the development successes in Europe, North America, and Asia. The more successful cases were the ones which were smarter at adopting available technologies of the time to maximize their value added. <clears throat> this process which I like to refer to as traditional economics of development, has guided our thinking and our practices as economists and has steered us towards investing in education, health, infrastructure, which has helped developing countries achieve tremendous progress. Such progress is visible in developed as well as in successful developing countries. However, in our long successful drive for development, we have not paid as much attention to the issue of efficiency. As a result, inefficiencies have flourished, not only in government activities, which people traditionally associate with inefficiency, but also in private sector activities, and not only in product markets, but also in factor markets like labor and capital. By the way, this phenomenon did not happen in developing countries only, but in advanced countries as well. I am sure that participants here can point to numerous inefficiencies in their own industry and or country. I will just highlight a couple from my own country. Regardless of the metric one uses to measure development performance in Saudi Arabia, Achievements have been truly impressive since the 1970s, and one cannot but agree that the country is light years more advanced and competitive today than it was then. Let me give some examples. From a life expectancy at birth of 53 years only in 1970 to 75 years today, from a 31.5% literacy rate in 1970 to 94.3% in 2013. From 9,000 hospital beds in 1970 to over 64,000 beds in 2013. From 8,000 kilometers of intercity paved roads in, the in 1969 to over 64,000 kilometers in 2013. From only $5.6 billion in non-oil exports in 1999 to over $54 billion in 2013. The list can go on. These are enormous achievements that we are very proud to have made. But now, we realize that we had not paid enough attention to the efficiency side. For example, Despite the tremendous physical road infrastructure network completed in the last two decades and before, we still lack a project management office or a, what's called PMO culture. This refers to skills involved in documentation, guidance, and standardized metrics for project management and execution. Skills which allow economies of repetition in the execution of projects basically the type of skills that a company like Bechtel, for example, had when it helped us build two of our major industrial cities, talking about Jubail and Yamba. We have not yet acquired these types of skills on a broad basis. 
What I mean by that is that these skills have not been embedded in our day-to-day -day practices to make us maximize the value added from the resources we devote to various tasks. As a result, we keep making the same mistakes again and again and continue to depend to a large extent on foreign expertise to implement large infrastructure projects. Let me cite another example of our lack of adequate emphasis on efficiency. Despite our impressive network of highways, our large country has the unfortunate distinction of having some of the highest road fatalities in the world. We have 20 deaths from traffic accidents per day, and that I would attribute to lack of an efficient traffic management and enforcement system. Every participant here has no doubt had an encounter with some of the chaotic behavior on our roads. I believe that that could be substantially remedied with a more efficient traffic management and enforcement system. And what is even more important, I believe that such a system can be put in place without the need for additional resources. I could go on with examples of efficiency measures we can introduce, whether in education, health, or infrastructure that would add significant value to our economy. But I think that these two examples are sufficient to illustrate my point on efficiency and in the case of traffic management to show that some measures need not require additional resources. So I believe it is high time for us economists and development practitioners to redirect our attention to what I will call economics of efficiency. That does not mean ignoring or neglecting the traditional economics of development. Rather, we need to ensure enhanced focus on efficiency because I believe that there is an umbilical cord connecting the traditional economics of development and the economics of efficiency as both try to bring about or enhance development with capital D in all its aspects. And I believe that these measures or these issues apply to developed as well as developing countries alike. Panel participants and economists in this audience will recognize that I am not inventing here new concepts or new approaches. Efficiency has been part and parcel of our economics training all along. What I am advocating is simply a change in emphasis, the need to focus on efficiency, which in my view has become imperative. It has become essential for sustained growth in a highly globalized and increasingly competitive world economy. To survive and to flourish in this new environment, a country needs to be competitive. To advance, it needs to be even more competitive. Without focus on efficiency, increasing competitiveness, in my view, will be elusive. So will the prospects for a South-South panacea for underdevelopment. Thank you very much again for giving me this opportunity, and I look forward to a lively discussion by this distinguished panel. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back Lord Mandelson. Well, Minister, thank you very much indeed for those stimulating remarks. I now understand why as a minister uh, you are regarded um, as both controversial and popular. Um, controversial uh, because you speak your mind and popular because you don't mind criticizing your own side mm -hmm. and, and holding them to account. It's quite unusual for a minister. So thank you very much indeed uh, for those remarks. But what you seem to be saying uh, is that if we start chasing a, a development paradigm uh, of sort of south-south trade, south-south investment, south-south collaboration, south-south zit and south-south that, we'll be pursuing a full stall. That it's actually not a question of either or. Um, it's not a question of, you know, south versus north. It's not a question of agriculture versus manufacturing. 
it's not a question of low wages versus high wages, that there will be different patterns of development in different countries. But the, the key to all of them and their success is whether they are efficient and competitive enough and that government has a key role itself in injecting efficiency, not just into the economy as a whole, but to its own workings, its own operation. Uh, have I got you right? <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, yes, you have me right. And the point I wanted to make, again, is that we should not indulge in emotional feelings because we have emotional attachments. You know, we are the underdogs, we are the developing countries, and let's gang up together and try to do something. Well, my feeling is that we have to keep our eye on the ball. Development requires all of the traditional economics of development that we have learned, and Professor Hausman and others have done for many, many, many years, but also the efficiency. There is so much inefficiencies in the economies, in advanced economies as well as in developing economies, that leave a lot on the table unnecessarily. So we have to be a bit cold-blooded about our economic development paradigms to really develop and then be able to trade as much. And by the way, we in Saudi Arabia, if you look at our, the, the top four importers from Saudi Arabia, aside from oil, I'm talking about non-oil exports mm -hmm. of Saudi Arabia, they're going to developing countries. But the fifth one is an advanced economy. My point is that don't focus on South-South, focus on development and efficiency, and then you will be able to do more with the South as much as you will be able to do with the North. C could I then just put a point back to you that arose in the panel that I moderated first thing uh, this morning? And we were talking about uh, competitiveness and what makes the kingdom uh, successful. But a number of people on the panel and off the panel said that it's still too difficult to start and run a business in Saudi Arabia that the bureaucracy is still too great, that it takes too long to get permissions to start a business, uh, that there's no one-stop shop, that you have to go here and you have to go the other. And it was suggested um, uh, by our friend, the Prime Minister of Georgia, that what should be introduced here is what he did there, which was that people, when they're seeking uh, permission uh, to start a business in order to get the usual boxes ticked, that instead of waiting indefinitely for all those boxes to be ticked, uh, that they should take silence as consent. If the bureaucrats can't get back to them quickly enough, then after two weeks they'll assume that they've got the consent and off they go. Would you support that in the, in the kingdom? I would. I would. But I'll tell you, we're not far from there. I mean, also, in, in that session, the Minister of Commerce and Industry showed you all the, 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 the KPIs that he has introduced yes, in the did. licensing process yes, and all of did. that. You go and look, for example, at the Ministry of Interior. You do most of the work where we used to queue to get them. Now you do them all with your iPad or with your laptop. Yes. The same thing can be said for banking. I don't remember when was the last time I visited the bank. And a lot of people don't visit banks now because you do most of your work using your iPad or your laptop. So we have moved significantly in, in that direction, and we are held more accountable now. You heard what the Minister of mm. Commerce and Industry was saying. Mm. He was under a lot of heat from our former king, may he, yes. he uh, uh, rest, uh, in sleep, rest in peace, but also from the Crown Prince, who's now the, the present king, mm. and from all of the authorities and the other ministers in the cabinet. Okay. So there is a lot of pressure that is being put on everybody to come up with better more resilient and more efficient ways okay. of doing business. Have we, have we gotten everything right? I will be the last one to say. But we have done so much also, and we should continue the process. Okay. Let me ask you, Jen, two quick questions before I move on to the other members of the panel. The first is that having talked to a number of people in private business in Saudi Arabia, they say that increasingly they are looking to other countries in the region, but also in, uh, uh, in Africa, in Asia. They are following a, a, a sort of south-south route, but sometimes they feel 
the, the sort of sense coming from the government is that when, when their capital and their entrepreneurship is taken out of the country in this way, you know, to other countries in the south, that that's somehow unpatriotic. Do you feel that? Absolutely not. A vibrant economy has to have two-way street investments. If you only have investments coming in, that means you have some restrictions that are not seen by people. You should be able to invest overseas and you should be able to attract investments. Only when you have that two-way street movement. So there's no stigma attached to um, business Absolute, people in Saudi Arabia? Absolutely not. And actually here we don't have that. Okay. Look, I mean, can I ask you another question, a sure, follow-up question sure. to that? Another question issue raised with me by, by my friends in the private sector here. They, they say they want to develop these relationships, deploy their capital, uh, grow their trade uh, with other countries, not just in the South, but I mean um, a, a lot in the South, but let's not restrict it to that. But they feel that the government is not keeping pace with them in developing bilateral trade and investment uh, uh, relationships and negotiating agreements with other countries and other regions in the world that give them the access for their, uh, for their, uh, the, the market access that they're seeking and the protection for the investment they're undertaking. Do you think this is a fair criticism of the government that it's falling behind <coughs> uh, in making its own contribution to this spaghetti bowl of uh, bilateral and regional trade agreements we're seeing growing in the world? I will, are you being, are you I being left not, on the yeah, sidelines? No, I will not say we have a perfect, a perfect system, but I think we're light years much better than we were before we negotiated our accession to the WTO. And you were uh, involved, you and I were involved yeah. in some of those negotiations. And we I was come... given a very hard time indeed by the <laughs> Saudi negotiator, <laughs> Prince Abdulaziz, I remember, with great fondness. But we have come a long way along uh, those lines. But I think one thing that probably has not been mentioned by others, and that may explain some of the misunderstanding. In this country, with the oil boom of 1973, the pendulum has swung in our society to seek government jobs. So most of the young people wanted to have a good government job. And that explains why we have, till now, 75% of all working Saudis are working for the government. That's an abnormal portion, which means how many are left to work in the private sector, let alone be entrepreneurs. Okay, we've got but, that but point. Let me say, but the good news is that now if you talk with the young people in this, uh, in, in this room, or even at the universities, most of them want to be entrepreneurs now. So there is a paradigm shift in the way society looks at entrepreneurship and starting businesses with others. And this is probably one of the weaknesses that we had that now we are addressing as a society very well, and therefore the investors from overseas, they have much, many, many, many more counterparts in this country than they did five or 10 years ago. Thank you very much indeed, Minister. I want to move straight away, if I may, to uh, Professor uh, Ricardo uh, Hausman, who's the director of Harvard Center for international development. Professor, tell me and tell the audience, where do you agree with the minister and where do you disagree with him in what he's said so far? Well, first of all, let me thank, thank the organizers for the invitation. Let me express my condolences for um, the passing away of, of King Abdullah and my best wishes to the new king. Uh, let me um, also congratulate the minister for his clarity, his frankness. I always say that if a government wants credibility, uh, instead of painting a rosy picture, they should show that they know what are the problems that need fixing. And that gains credibility. So there are many things I, I agree with what he said. Uh, and I, I would definitely advise against a romantic view of South-South trade. But let me maybe explain why I think that it's important uh, to discuss why South-South trade now is an important complement to South-North trade and where, where is the value that, uh, that is, is in that relationship and what's the current state of affairs. So, <clears throat> uh, 
why has so much of the trade been south north? Well, because as Willie Horton say, because that's where the money is. Uh, the north is 16% of the world's population, but 70% of GDP at market prices. So if you're in the south, where's the big market? It's in the north. Uh, and that's, that has been the reality up to now. Uh, but now the south is growing faster than the north. And the relative weights of the two are changing. At purchasing power parity, the GDP of the north and the GDP of the south are now 50-50. Not at market prices, but at PPP prices. And uh, the South is growing faster than the North. Europe is growing at, I don't know, 1%. The U.S. is growing at 2%. You know, China is growing at 7 India will grow, you know, 5, 6, 7. Uh, you know, Southeast Asia is growing. East Africa is growing. So, so um, uh, Eastern Europe is growing faster than Western Europe. So, so the, the, um, the less rich countries are, are growing. And that means that, you know, now there's more money there. So, so there's a better case for why, why South-South trade. But uh, there's also a different aspect, which, which is um, if you look at the composition of exports in any region, if I take, for example, I'm from Venezuela, the trade between what does Colombia export to the U.S. and what does Colombia export to Venezuela? Completely different packages. To the U.S., they'll export uh, oil, they'll export flowers, they'll export essentially their more basic products to the rich countries. To Venezuela, they will export cars, uh, manufactured products, chemical products. So the range of goods is much wider, and the range of services is much wider and very different. And uh, the same thing is if, if you look, for example, what Ghana exports to the U.K. and what Ghana exports to Guinea or what uh, Rwanda exports to the UK and what Rwanda exports to, to Burundi or to Uganda and so on. In every single country, you'll find that the export package is very different. So it adds to the diversity of your exports. And more importantly, you export to other poor countries your more complex, your more sophisticated products. And that is because there is this fundamental difference between selling to the north and selling to the south that if you're in the South and you're selling to the South, you're selling to people that have an income level that is more similar to yours. The average income of the North is $40,000. The average income of the South is $4,000. Those consumers have very different needs. When they go to the supermarket, they have very different needs. When they buy a cell phone, they want prepaid and not postpaid because they're not eligible to credit. They, they, and if you're going to design products that are appropriate for your consumer, they're more likely to be appropriate to consumers that are a little bit like your consumers. So it expands your, your set of products. So I think that the more the merrier, north is good, south is good, south adds some, some qualities that was not there before. But by the same token, the south has been very close to itself. I have stood on the border between Zim, um, uh, Botswana, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. And I've seen miles and miles and miles of lorries, trucks, waiting to cross the border. I've stood on the border between Uganda and Kenya, miles and miles of, to cross those borders. So the South has been very close to the South. And there's a lot to be gained from opening up the South to the south. Yeah. And from that perspective, I'm very optimistic of things that are happening in my part of the world with this agreement of the Pacific Alliance between Chile, Peru, Colombia, and Mexico. All have free trade agreements with the U.S., all open up, opening up to themselves. But Professor, yeah. can, I, can, I, can I just, I mean, you're, you're making, you're putting your finger here on a, on a real problem. Hmm? I mean, it's physically very difficult in many cases amongst countries in the South to get your goods or your services into those markets beyond those borders. It's not just a question of uh, tariffs, it's about very complex regulatory uh, regimes that it's very difficult to navigate your way through. You've talked about the lack of trade facilitation 
I mean, the, that the physical yeah. means of getting your goods through a port or along a road or, or on a rail line. Um, but also, when you're talking about deploying your capital or creating production and producing goods in, in, in other countries in the South, and I admit that I'm making a wild generalization here, but you have less efficient protection of your intellectual property, you have less efficient capital pools and banking platforms very often uh, in those countries. You oftentimes don't have uh, the same rule of law that you have in northern, more developed uh, 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 countries. You have less efficient ways for resolving uh, business to business uh, disputes. Um, I mean, it, it, it's sometimes an uphill uh, struggle, wouldn't you agree, uh, when you're trying to not just trade but invest in other countries of the South. And I accept that I'm making a great generalization here. No, you're, you're making a, a, a very good point. As, as I said about the minister, when you identify a problem, you are yes. contributing. So I think that in my part of the world, at least in Latin America, what has happened is that in the process of negotiating access to the North, people develop some skills in terms of, of negotiating. There's been some demands of improving their, their institutions are improving the rule of law because of relations with the North. And they're using now those skills, that know-how, to negotiate among uh, countries in the South. So the Mexicans were very good at negotiating with the U.S. and negotiating with the EU. Okay. So now they, they can negotiate with Peru, with Colombia. And All so right. On. All good points. I want to uh, move on, if I may, to uh, Dr. Kim Dohoon, President of Korea's Institute of International Economic and Trade. Um, doctor, if I'm not mistaken, you, you, you're, you're developing a, a, a concept in which countries of the South should uh, combine their accumulated assets, that somehow uh, countries with natural resources and those that have successfully developed their industrial bases uh, should combine uh, uh, with those without either natural resources or industries. Sorry to ask you to sum this up very quickly, but in a minute or two, just tell me, what exactly is the point you're trying to make here? Actually, um, uh, I'd like to uh, reiterate maybe the gratitude to the um, organizers and also the uh, condolences to the Saudi government. Um, Actually, um, when you look at the um, South South cooperation, uh, it is compared to uh, North South cooperation, it is very small as an uh, amount, and also very inadequate uh, because small because South is short of resources, as uh, Professor Hausman said, there is no money there. And inadequate because South South Cooperation has not been responding to keen aspirations of each other. So how to improve? Uh, we cannot fix easily the shortage of resources, the problem of shortage of money. But we can try to find out keen aspirations of each other in order to respond to them. So I, uh, as uh, Lord Manderson mentioned, I tried to uh, classify um, countries uh, in three, uh, three, three categories. Countries with natural resources, just imagine Saudi Arabia. Countries that have successfully developed industries, just imagine Korea. In countries without natural resources, no industries. Just imagine the countries with less than $4,000 income. So um, when you look at the um, countries with natural resources, uh, they have accumulated assets such as financial resources and sometimes very qualified manpower because you educated your people very well. But you have your own aspirations. You want to diversify industries that can provide decent jobs to your people. But you have shortcomings also. 
you don't have any incentives of hard working for ordinary people because they are financially well assisted by your government. So you can be demanders of knowledge of industrial, industrialization or industrial di diversification, and you can be suppliers of financial resources to other countries. Just look at uh, the countries that have successfully developed industries, Korea, for example. Uh, we have accumulated a lot of knowledge of breeding entrepreneurship. That is, I think, very important part of development history in Korea. And the knowledge of industrial diversification. But we have also some sh shortcomings. We have maturing industries and decreasing population. And we have aspirations in order to catch up the technologies and industries of North countries. And we have aspiration for securing markets of our industries. So, so your point, Dr. De Hood, De Hood, if I'm not uh, right, is is there a complementarity? Right, right, exactly. Between, need, between what certain countries need and mm -hmm. what others in the South have to offer. Okay. So um, we might, the first category of countries and second category of countries, for example, Saudi Arabia and Korea would cooperate to assist the third type of countries which have less than $4,000 income because they are very much aspired to uh, make their uh, economy take off without any okay. resources. So maybe with financial resources from Saudi Arabia and knowledge from Korea, we can help them okay. to develop. That's a very good point. We've got that. But I want to put it, if I may, to Dr. Pardinas, because he is the executive uh, director of the Mexican Institute for Competitiveness. Um, and I want to ask you, Dr. Pardinas, do, do you recognize some, some truth or some relevance in what uh, Dr. Dahoon has said in your own experience in Mexico, or where do you uh, differ with him? Hmm. Uh, first, I want to give uh, my condolences to our generous hosts for the passing of uh, King Abdullah. And it's a privilege to be part of this uh, panel. Uh, there's an African tale that uh, it's a good metaphor for the opening speech of uh, Minister Mohammed. And the tale says that uh, every morning an antelope wakes in, in Africa and he's worried, the antelope, that he has to run faster than the pack of lions, because if not, the antelope will become the dinner of the antelopes. And that same morning, a lion wakes up in Africa and knows that he has to run faster than the antelopes, because if not, at the end of the day, they will go to sleep. So no matter if you're an antelope or a lion, <laughs> When the sun rises, you know you have to run faster. And uh, I think from the perspective of the global economy, if it's south-south, south, north-south, it's a network of cooperation and competition. And even competition, it's in a way a form of cooperation. Because when you see what your neighbor is doing better, it encourages you to, to, do, to perform better or to change what you, are, what you are doing. And I think my own country, Mexico, it's, it's an example of this urge uh, to run every morning. Like 30 years ago, we have uh, an oil-based economy around 80% of our exports were related to oil. Due to the opening of the North American Free Trade Agreement, we could diversify our exports much better. Now, uh, like 70, 80% of the exports represent uh, manufacturing. But then, once we were a manufacturing hub, other countries, especially China, emerged as the huge manufacturing hub of the world. 
So we became a manufacturing hub. We, we make the transition from oil to manufacturing. Now we were manufacturing, but in China they were, they were doing it much efficient, efficient than us. With the changes in the price uh, of, of oil at the beginning of the century, and it was more expensive to ship goods from across the Pacific, Mexican exports had, had a, a new opportunity, and the, the, the trade between Mexico and the U.S. was improving due to manufacturing. But last summer, I, I visited, I spent most of the summer visiting uh, labs of advanced manufacturing in the U.S., new technologies like uh, 3D printing, for example. And I could foresee, not in this year, not in the next year, but the competition for a country like Mexico doing manufacturing would not be an, a different country, would be new technologies. And we will have to adapt and keep on running in order to keep the pace of change. So no matter if it's another country or, or new technologies, we have to keep pace of reforms to adapt to changes, to, uh, to, to adapt to a world that is changing much more faster than some of our countries could adapt to. Dr. Martinez, that's a very, very interesting experience coming from Mexico. But can I ask you this question? Most people think that we're seeing now a structural shift in the oil price. Do you think that in Mexico's case, but you could think of other examples of uh, similar oil-based economies, this will mean fewer resources, revenues, narrower tax base available to invest in and develop your country, or on the other hand, do you think differently that having to depend or being tempted to depend less on oil will be a stimulus to diversify and, do, and to develop other parts of your economy? Is it, a, is, it a, is, it a, is it good news or bad news, therefore, for Mexico that the oil price is going down? It depends if it's short or long term. The economy is not so dependent on oil currently, but the finance of the government it still is. Around 30 cents of every dollar in public expenditure in Mexico comes from oil. So a change in the prices of oil affects directly uh, government finances, fiscal balances, the need maybe to reduce spending or increase taxes. But in the long term, I think it, it's kind of a sovereign experience to, to understand that you cannot depend, uh, uh, that government finances cannot depend strictly on the price of a commodity that has extreme volatility. And sometimes there, you, you have good, uh, good uh, periods where your government finances are, are healthy, but if price changes and it creates a stability inside the country, I think it sends a, a good signal of the need to reform and to uh, so try to achieve what we did in the whole economy, reducing the amount of uh, oil de dependency to change it also and, and apply that experience that we already had uh, at the end of the 20th century regarding government finances. So basically what you're saying, use it and enjoy it, but don't become addicted to it to the point of dependency and don't expect it will last forever. Minister, what would your observation be on what, uh, on what uh, uh, Dr. Pardinas has just said about oil-based economies? I, I agree with him. I mean, it's different from one country to another. I mean, uh, Mexico uh, does not rely as much on revenues from oil, although they are important. So it's a different uh, it's a different system for countries that have huge amount of their government revenues coming from oil or less. So I think uh, it's a case-by-case -case issue. You ca we cannot generalize okay. uh, from let, that. Let me ask one la last question because we're nearing the end. Dr. Pedinas, uh, sorry, made a point about NAFTA. In your view, uh, uh, Professor Hausman, how important a role can be played by these trade agreements in exerting external pressure for competitiveness in a country that is signed up in, into such a trade agreement? Well, I think um, uh, you mentioned the spaghetti bowl beforehand uh, about um, bilateral agreements, but 
you know, uh, for a country... It, sorry, yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. Yeah, you, speak, you, you, right into my yeah you mentioned the spaghetti bowl yes. problem of bilateral agreements, but in a world where, you know, uh, the WTO is kind of stuck, the Doha round was not approved, bilateral agreements do open up opportunities uh, for additional trade. There is some trade diversion. It opens up opportunities for additional trade, and it imposes significant disciplines on countries. Uh, disciplines in terms of, of uh, the treatment of investment, the treatment of intellectual property. It, it, in, it, it helps them develop their institutions and prepare themselves to be uh, valid players in, in, in global trade. And as the world becomes more organized in terms of global value chains, I think uh, opening up your country to those possibilities is key. And in this, I, I wanted to, to mention the Just critical... Very quickly, because we're out yeah. of time. Yeah. Well, um, let me leave it there. Go on. Uh, and and, and, and a, a final point on oil. Um, we are now going to see who was, who was uh, uh, you know, swimming with a bathing suit and who was swimming without a bathing suit uh, as, as the sea level goes down. And, uh, you know... Is Sama has essentially three years of oil revenues in reserve. Uh, Kazakhstan has seven years of oil revenues in reserves. And my own country was broke with a price of oil at 100 and cannot tolerate, uh, can, cannot tolerate these prices and it's spiraling out of control. So uh, learning how to live with a volatile resource and making the best of it is a critical, critical social skill that a country with uh, natural resources has to have. Well, I think there's a very good message in that uh, for all of us. And uh, whether we're with bathing suits or without bathing suits, uh, and whether we're antelopes or lions, we've all got to run faster, otherwise somebody's going to eat our lunch or have us for lunch. Thank you very much indeed.